Hello and welcome to Jung at Harp. We are going to talk about overwhelm today. I am Deborah Henson Conant. I'm a composer and performer, and this is Kathleen Wiley, and she is a Jungian analyst, and we both play the harp. So <laughs> this is called Jung at Harp, and we're talking about many different things, all the subjects that we want to talk about through the lenses of the strings of passion, which is my concepts of creative expression, and also through the lens of Jung, Carl Jung and his ideas. And today we are talking about the subject of overwhelm. <laughs> so shall I start Kathleen or would you like to start? Oh, why don't you start? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, I was interested in talking about overwhelm because I discover that especially when there's a time that something uh, is new in life, so there's something that's coming in from another angle, say some, um, you know, emergency, whether it's a snow emergency or whatever it is, or, or something wonderful, just something, something new in my life, I can tend to get scattered and overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. and, and when I'm feeling scattered and overwhelmed, I feel like I'm taking a lot of actions and none of them are effective. None of them have impact. Mm -hmm. They're not really connecting. And when that happens, people have often said, well, make a list. So I make a list and it just feels scattered to me. But I notice that when I break it down through the strings of passion and look at what is my impulse. So the strings of passion are impulse, structure, character, roles, practice, deconstruction, and liftoff. And I'll just go through how I go through those. Mm -hmm. So from impulse, I'm asking myself, okay, what is my intention here? What, what was the, what, what touched me that makes me want to do this thing, whatever it is, or this group of things? What's the structure? So that's the first. The second is what's the structure? And lately I've been taking, instead of making some kind of a list, I'll make um, a, a, a schematic so I can see it all on one page and I can see how things connect to each other. So I see the structure of the whole machine of what I'm doing. Then I like to break it down into roles because roles, no, oh no, character. That's the next string. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, so character, what atmosphere do I want to have while I'm doing this? How do I want to feel? What kind of character do I want all of this to have? What kind of character do I want the final product to have? What kind of character do I want to have while I'm doing it? Mm -hmm. So at that point, I then kind of know what I'm doing. I have a schematic of it and I know how I want to feel while I'm doing it. Then it's start time to break it down into the roles and the practices. So for me, the roles are, um, it can be very co complicated. It can be looking at, or not complicated, it's actually com com compound, um, which is taking apart the complicated and mm -hmm. anyway, but um, compound in that, you know, what are the roles? What, you know, what's functioning together with what and what supports what? And also, are there roles that I'm going to take on and that I'm going to give to other people? So that's roles. And then finally, the practices. So instead of being like, here's your checklist and you do this, what are my practices? How am I going to go about doing this? What is going to be my method of doing this? Mm -hmm. And can I practice parts of it so I feel more comfortable with it? So for me, that might even have to do with the practice of cleaning off my desk every hour mm -hmm. just to create mm -hmm. space for myself. Then um, by that point, I just did deconstruct it, but, but it's good for me to stop and go back and look at what I'm doing and definitely make notes for next time. And then hopefully lift off is when it's finally working when I am communicating to people mm -hmm. or connecting with people. That's because that's almost always the final one. So that's, that is when, when I'm really thinking well and using the strings of passion, that is how I deal with overwhelm. Right. So how about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I, I want to start with is that um, the liftoff also gives you a connection to yourself. So what you're really after, because what we all are missing when we feel overwhelmed is the connection to our larger self. It's like if we imagine that we're like a, a pie with different slices and those different slices of the pie represent different impulses that have taken shape into various structures and character and those kinds of things in the strings then often what happens with overwhelm is we bounce between the pie pieces instead of being in the center of the pie where we're connected to all of it. 
or feeling held by the larger um, circumference of the pa where all those parts of ourselves are held together. So <clears throat> one of the tools that often um, therapists use and that Carl Jung himself used when he was on the front lines during one of the world wars is to draw um, mandalas. And a mandala has been used throughout the centuries by various um, spiritual seekers as a centering device. And very simplistically put, a mandala is a circle that you draw where you fill it in with colors and shapes, words, images that just you let yourself do spontaneously. You don't think about it. It's not like a work of art you're breaking apart and creating intentionally. It is something you intentionally allow to emerge because, oh, now I want to put purple in, or oh, now I want to draw a bird, or oh, now. It, it, so it is a way of being with yourself and giving expression to all of the impulses or those pie pieces which again, we might think of as energy centers, ping pong balls bouncing around, giving expression to those impulses through imagery so that one can begin again to stand with one's whole self in relationship versus just being compelled forward by any one impulse. When we get overwhelmed, often there are several, I think of it, and, and not every Jungian analyst may think of it this way, but I think of it, as we've got multiple impulses firing at one time and we don't have a connection to our center and which is connected to our larger self to be able to really think about it and not think rationally but think abstractly like putting the puzzle together so i you know what i you know what i love about that is and I was look as I was looking in my mind's eye right. at that mandala and and then at, at the schematics that I make. Um, that my schematics are very um, very engineering. They're, you know, they're 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 mechanical, which is great because I really love machines, and and that makes sense for certain of the things that I'm doing. They're, I'm creating machines, but what I'm hearing you say is, and as I was listening to you and re thinking about this mandala and thinking about it actually in three dimensions, mm -hmm. I could draw it, but then it's actually in three dimensions. I was thinking of it, you know, it's a completely, it's so different than anything mechanical that does, that works step by step. Yes. Yes, because it's all going on simultaneously. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a place for the schematic that's mechanical in nature right. and helping one order one's day and one's workload or one's right. kind of creative project load. But for right. connecting with our larger self and for moving through emotions like overwhelm right. or anxiety or even ecstatic joy, then the, the mechanical doesn't work because that's not a mechanical process. Our emotions are not mechanical in nature. They're you know, you kept saying, as we were talking at the beginning of this, you, were, you kept saying um, something about liftoff. Maybe mm -hmm. that's liftoff, you know, because we're always talking about what is liftoff. And I, I think, which is, the, which is the seventh string, and I think right. you're absolutely right, that that liftoff is the moment where all these schem schematics in a sense, in like a cartoon, when they come to life and start taking their place and start dancing in that circle, that is you communicating and connecting. Right. And, and I would give, would say first to yourself, yeah. then to other people. Right. right. Um, you know, one of the ways that I think, and, and you know, Jung's work supports this, but I, I like the thinking of it in terms of a, the uh, Kabbalistic model which is that we live in four worlds simultaneously. And different energy modalities and spiritual traditions talk about this in their language, but this is the way I like to think about it simplistically. We live in four worlds. We live on the physical plane, we live in the emotional plane, we live in the mental plane, and we live on the spiritual plane. And the reality is that they all coexist, that at any given moment in time, if we're dealing with something physical, it also has an emotional component, a mental component, and a spiritual component. If we're dealing with the spiritual energy, like a creative fire in, in us, mm -hmm. then it also has a mental, emotional, and physical expression. 
we might not always know what the other worlds, the other expressions are in the moment. We can kind of get fixated and just be looking at one world at a time. But in reality, they're all going on simultaneously. And often when we feel overwhelmed or anxiety, it's because we're only focused on one world, but there's something else going on in one of the other worlds we need to know about also that's affecting us. So I like thinking, like if we think about every impulse we feel, by the time we call it an impulse, from a psychological perspective, we're talking about an instinctive biological prompt. Now, from a creative musical point of view, we might be talking about that um, you know, impulse to hear a certain sound or to express a certain energy movement in our body. Um, but either way, that impulse ultimately has correlates in every plane. And you know, for Jung, the instinct gave birth to the impulse and the spiritual plane gave birth to the archetype or the universal template. Can you say that again? Yeah, <laughs> that the instinct, the impulse comes from the instinctive physical realm and that the archetype or what Jung would have called the universal template energetically comes from the spiritual plane. And that they then give rise to certain emotions mm -hmm. and certain images and ways of thinking. Thus, they give rise to the emotional plane and the mental plane. But see, it all flows together. So there's no way to, there's no way, well, there is a way because the world does it all the time. And this is what the Eastern traditions talk about as being illusion. You know, we act as if the physical realm is all there is and that there's, it's not being impacted by the other three or the people who get really out there spiritually act as if the spiritual realm is all there is. Well, the truth is, you know what? It all coexists and everything that has a spiritual prompt ends up in something on the physical plane and every impulse or instinct has a spiritual correlate. And when we can think like that, and I think that's part of the deconstruction, this is how it comes back. If in the deconstruction, we can think where, what is this expression on every one of these, in every one of these worlds, then we do begin to find the whole of ourselves instead of just a part. We begin to have the whole pie of who we are versus one sliver. That's so, that's so interesting because I remember that as I was developing the strings of passion and, mm -hmm. and my in, 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 intention was to break down the creative process. And then af, as I did that and started working with it, I became aware of that thing that you were talking about, that um, the, um, the, almost the mirroring or the fact that, that uh, well, the experience I had as, as I played mm -hmm. my harp was that there was a harp inside me and everything I engaged with, with my hands or my eyes or whatever, there was, it was also inside me, almost like a mirror, but in, in different dimensions. And as I, as, as I engaged with it differently on the inside, so I engaged differently with it on the outside. Mm -hmm. As I engaged differently on the outside, it changed on the inside. And I started having this feeling of this, um, you know, infinite loop right of of connection between what what i was doing and who i'm being who i'm evolving to mm -hmm. so um, so i can see that um you know as i make my schematic i'm looking at all the individuals and then as as you describe your mandala we're talking about the organism in a sense mm -hmm. and how it works together and um and i'm just thinking about when i first learned how to play the harp the pedal harp. Um, so the pedal harp is a really unusual instrument. And one of the reasons I loved it is it's so mechanical. Mm. So it's got these naked strings, which are very, you know, uh, you know, emotional and, and raw. And then it's got this incredible mechanism with seven pedals. So the pedal harp is like all the white keys of a piano. To get the black notes, you have to hit these pedals. Mm -hmm. So there's this incredible coordination, which at first feels like I'm doing two different things at once. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the experience over time of starting to understand the connection between what note I was going to play and what foot I was hitting and the position, that became a really beautiful, I mean, I talk about my little harp as being like a physical um, prosthetic as, mm -hmm. as a, or as a creative prosthetic. And um, 
because I can speak with it in ways, I have a new voice with it. The big harp with the pedals became this incredible sense of, of mechanism within my body mm -hmm. that I really loved. So um, going, so, and so, so I feel like there's almost three things there. There's um, the, the schematic, there's the organism, and then there's something about how we integrate with mechanical things. And, and I think you, and I think that may be a step between when we become an organism with it. So I think when I get overwhelmed, I'm caught between the schematic, mm. my mechanical interaction with what seems like two different things and not yet at the place where I can actually act like an organism. Yeah, I mean, I think from um, in Jungian language, we might say there's when you get caught in the mechanistic, you lose access to your larger self. Interesting. You so now, people, but, yeah. Uh, but I want to say I was just playing in my mind and wondering if you ex would wanted to experiment if after you made your schematics, what would happen? I was just wondering in your yeah. body if you then drew a circle around the schematic and filled in the background of the schematic with colors. I, I, I just and I know you have done um, in the start of your class, um, you forget if you call it moodling but the drawing you encourage oh people. right that's right i i have a i, I there's a, a creativity gym in yeah, which yes. I, I tried to put all the different prompts that i came across in my life and one of them is 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 is, is splotches there that, you go. Yes. then you start to cease so i see so you're okay so just to tell people who are watching these yes. splotch drawings um um an artist taught me this once that we, we just take things and we just splotch them down on the paper and then you'll start to see something in that splotch. It's like when you see things mm -hmm. in the, the, the um, water damage on your ceiling, if you have. <laughs> um, and, 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 and it's an experiment in learning to see before you draw so that you draw what you see instead of mm -hmm. what's there. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying is um, take that schematic, which is very mechanical, Mm -hmm. and start um start making a human in yeah. a sense yeah because if we're looking at if we're looking for practices mm. of how do we integrate these things right. then the the mechanical schematic works for you in many ways but it doesn't work when you're overwhelmed because what I'm, I'm suggesting from the psychological and spiritual point of view that I hold is that that's because there's some emotional impulses that need expression. So that the more nonlinear, non-rational circle with colors and shapes around the schematic could allow expression for that. So it would be a way of bringing the two together. Because one of ba Jung's basic tenets is that in order to move forward toward wholeness, in order to be able to think in the, and not logical thinking, but think in the abstract sense, is we have to be able to hold the tension of the opposites. And then when we can hold the tension of the opposites, i.e. rational, non-rational, mechanical, emotional, then the organic psyche will work on our behalf and something will integrate. We don't make the integration happen or the liftoff happen, but we set up the conditions by consciously holding the tension of the opposites. So what we're playing with is if you take your schematic and then draw a circle around it and put in the color with it, making it thus into a mandala. Right. Or you can start the other way around. You can draw the mandala and then let the schematic emerge from that. Um, then, then what we're doing is we've come up with the practice to intentionally hold the tension of the opposites, which then is like gardening in our psyche, inviting something to grow. That's great. So what I'm hearing you say are two things. One, um, to, to balance, not to, 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 to be within the paradox of the paradox of these two seemingly mm -hmm. opposing things. And do not experience them as contradictions, but to be in that paradox. That's one thing. And then I'm hearing you say the conclusion that we came to last, last time, which mm -hmm. is play with it. Yeah. 
Yeah, because play allows the coexistence, the coexistence of what to the rational mind contradicts and could not, it could not in any way coexist. Mm -hmm. But reality is opposites exist all over the place. That's the paradox of life, you know. We, want, we can want two very opposing things simultaneously. Right. And again, from a Jungian point of view, when we align with only one side and deny the other is where we become neurotic. That in truth, we become healthier, both mentally, emotionally, and physically, and I believe spiritually, when we can make room for all of it. As, as um, the spiritual master and teacher, um, Jesus said, um, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God. You know, all of the great religious and spiritual traditions and the, the, the teachers, the founders um, teach, we have to let everything have its place. So what is it exactly does that mean? Give unto Caesar what is Caesar and give unto God what is God? Is that it means, yes, you need the mechanistic ego driven. This is what I'm going to do to move oh, forward on this I project. But we also have to make room for the various emotions that are coming up around it. Wow. So what I hear you, and I, now I really get why you're talking, why you've been saying that this is, this is part of liftoff. Because in liftoff, right. it, you have allowed everything to, um, it, it's no longer broken down. Lift off, right. lift off, and lift off is the moment when you're not trying to put it together, but right. when you when you allow what has been put together in you up to this point to actually be in action or be in, in propulsion. Yeah, we might say again to surrender to the moment, to surrender right. to what in the moment you're you are feeling and experiencing and wants to flow through you to the heart for instance if you're playing the heart in right. the moment and i see that what you're saying is um we can create the conditions of this integration we can't sit down and say i am going to integrate da, da, that's da, right. da, 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 da. we that's do right. that's where art and playing with something creates the integration that's right that's right. It invites it. It allows it to happen. Right. And, and this is where, you know, I believe great pieces of art and great works of music and various things, you know, architecture, whatever the expression is, the reason they have, may have lasting power for a lot of people over generations is because they give an expression to something that's come, some opposites that have come together in the moment. And thus, by seeing it in the outer world, something inside resonates. Again, we're back to the heart. Right. We the string, it resonates, something in us resonates. Or we surrender to what's resonating in us and we find the string that corresponds to that. Right. You know, there's a resonance and thus we continue then to know ourselves more. You know, yeah, to become and, and more consciously whole. So, okay, so we experience that. And I often experience um, that something clicks into place. I mean, when you say, yes. you know, when art shows us something, um, and I realize that this is also this, this playing, um, you know, physic, you know, physically mm -hmm. somehow with things, I realize this is what I'm, what I, what I think often students, people who are playing the harp, my students are missing because yeah. they're trying to do, we're tr me and I'll put myself in there, we're trying to do something right instead of having the time to play with it yeah. because when we play with it and i'm really thinking like this is such a big deal for me i really want to work on this when i play with it that's when the actual work is happening the yeah. actual integration and it becoming part of me and me being able to actually speak with it and this right. is why I, I say to students um it to oops I don't know that was fixed anyway I don't know if the sound will change um why I say to students you know put a timer on for two or three times longer than you think you could bear to play this piece mm -hmm. because that's when you will start finding and you know finding things or stumbling into things or it will start to become yours yeah yeah i mean again what you're doing is you're encouraging them by setting the timer to go beyond their comfort zone and if we are going to become whole and from again a, a psychological Jungian psychological point of view if we're going to become individuated and live more of the truth of who we are then we're going to go through a lot of discomfort and 
our culture has taught us discomfort is bad and we need to make it go away as quickly as possible, even if it means numbing with a pill or with oh, a drink or whatever. And so what you're also saying, and I believe this is true in life and in music, if you're going to become um, a harpist or a musician where you play out of your soul or you're going to become a person who lives the truth of who you are, then you're going to have moments of discomfort. You're going to stretch outside of your comfort zone because that's the only way we grow. And you know, as you're saying it, I'm thinking, I'm thinking actually what we're doing is we're expanding our comfort zone. Yes, that's right. So we're, 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 we're expanding it so that when we're in it, it's much, much, much larger and expanding that um, and expanding the definition of comfort as mm -hmm. well. Yes. And developing our own capacity to bear more and more. Sometimes we're overwhelmed. For instance, I know for myself and my guess is for you that you can handle a lot more things or juggle a lot more balls in the air on the outer world and internally now than 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. I know I can, that my capacity to, to keep myself centered when there are multiple things coming at me unexpected is far greater now than it was 20 or 30 years ago because I've, I have continued to be on a path of growth, which does mean expansion, which means being able to keep ourselves in relationship to more. A lot of overwhelm is because we lose ourselves, and and that's not a judgment. That's not a you know. Often people feel when they get overwhelmed or anxious that it means something's wrong with them. It means that they're bad. It means they failed, and it it doesn't. It's just information. And if we can quit judging ourselves when these feeling states come up and say, "Wow, okay, what's this telling me?" And and often what it's letting us know is where our limits are and where the opportunity for growth or expansion is. And when we can begin to relate to anything that happens to us in that way, it changes everything. You know, then instead of shutting down the impulse because ultimately overwhelm or even anxiety or ecstatic joy begins from an impulse. Instead of shutting it down or demonizing, we say, oh, wow, look at that energy state. What structures might it flow into? What character might I want to let it take? Versus, oh my God, I want to shut it down. And then it just gets bigger and bigger because it wants to have its place. It wants its cue. <laughs> okay, so a uh, bunch of questions. Okay. Um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we see when we're um, starting to judge ourselves? Because um, I often you know, realize only after the fact, maybe a couple of days, I was judging myself. And um, yes, and, 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 then, um, and then I, you know, as we wrap up, I would like to just kind of go back over, you know, how people can utilize, because I feel like we talked about two wonderful things, which is the mechanical breakdown mm -hmm. and the organic um, humanizing, mm -hmm. both, you know, both of which are really, really part of of engaging and playing with overwhelm mm -hmm. so that we can just be whelmed whatever that <laughs> means <laughs> so so um so if you can what what are some tips for people to know when they're judging themselves because i know that you know it's it's um you know it's distressing to us to, to judge ourselves but i think a lot of us don't know when we're doing it so the first thing is you have to have a practice to develop self-awareness of your own self-talk. And so that's the first thing. And one practice that anybody can do is just stream of consciousness journaling, which we talked about before. The second thing one can do is what Jack Cornfield, if I'm remembering correctly, and his old book, A Path with Heart, talks about it as insight meditation, mm. where you just sit and you just notice whatever's coming up in you. You just notice it and then you breathe it out. You just notice so that you're paying attention to what comes up, body sensation, thought wise. That's the second practice you can do to develop an awareness of what you're saying to yourself. The second thing you can do is um, pay attention to what you are feeling in your body. If you're starting to feel guilty, ashamed, like you're bad, like, you're fa like you failed, 
like you're a nobody, then chances are you're judging yourself. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the second thing is then having a daily practice to develop an awareness of what you're feeling in your body. And when we, t we talked in another video about the simplest, simplistic doing a body scan twice a day for 10 minutes, lay down on the floor of the bed, start at your feet, work your way up to the head, top of your head, just observing whatever you're feeling in your body. Because most of us go through the day, majority of people having no idea what's happening in their body and no idea what's happening in their inner world with their own inner dialogue. So those are the, those are the starting point because then you can begin to relate to whatever's going on. I can begin to talk to the tightness in my stomach and say, you know what? I'm going to breathe deep. You can let go. I'm taking good precautions here. I know how to help us navigate through this situation. Or I can talk to that tightness in my chest and say, I know you're scared that someone's really offering you something loving and a party don't trust it, but let's breathe deep. We have a history with this person. We know they're trustworthy, you know, but if I'm not aware of that signal, that messenger from my own body mind, mm -hmm then I'm gonna go into a false self or I'm gonna go into a character or a role that is not the largesse of who I am. Mm. I'll get caught in a little pie sliver and then the rest of me's left out. And that's not at all satis a satisfying way to live. So I, I think I may have gotten into a third one there, but definitely, you know, tracking, we know we're, gonna, we're judging ourselves by paying attention to self-talk by paying attention to what's going on in our body and the body scan, the stream of consciousness journaling, insight meditation are three primary things. And the other thing I want to put a plug in for is we all tend to think something that to, that's going to be effective has to be complicated. Uh -huh. And the reality is that these three simple practices done every day would transform your life. It is the simplistic, basic practices that make the most profound transformations in us. And so I just want to put a plug in if people are thinking, well, that sounds like nothing. How's that going to help me? Try it. Don't believe me. Try it. <laughs> and then write us and tell us what happened. <laughs> right. I mean, because we, we get caught in the idea that more complex, bigger is better. And it really isn't when it comes to being with ourselves and expanding and in, in a good way yeah I, I i hear exactly what you're saying that that um we we tend to think we want to get more and more and more and more complex and complex is good and complex and and in fact when it comes to um practices when we're when we can actually do do what we're doing is when it starts to expand and I had a, a, a final vision uh, when you were talking about, first, I, I, I heard you saying that we can find the judgment often in words and, and, and physical gestures within yes. ourselves. And those words are often in our head. They don't necessarily get spoken out loud. And, That's right. And we don't necessarily see them in our bodies, although we sometimes can see them better. Um, and, and I think we often hear them in other people's words and see them in other people's bodies as well. Yes. Um, and so observing what what's bothering us and others can all, often help us. I mean, we all know that. Um, so then the other image that I had that I really loved to kind of put this all together was if I put my schematic of, you know, what it is I need to do and then around it a mandala that starts to bring the humanity into it and the organic part of it, I could on the outside of that mandala, put the words that are about the anxiety that I have or, or the, the things that are getting in my way or the overwhelm so that they're there. I can see them outside and, and that could be a way to play with them as well. Yes. And then I would say then draw another circle outside of there because you also want those contained okay. so that the positive balances them. Great. They get outside the circle, i.e. symbolic of outside of our own self, then they have a lot more power than if we keep them inside where they can be tempered by the rest of us that says, you know what? I've got 30 years here. I know what I'm doing. Be quiet. <laughs> you know? Okay. And I see, and I get on board and put support here. <laughs> and, and I see that that also embraces them and, and, and acknowledges that they are part of us. 
Yes. And, and okay, that's great. Well, Kathleen, yeah. I, I feel like I have a, I feel like I'm coming away from this session with something very, very concrete that I can do to deal with overwhelm and, and, but far more than that, I feel like I'm coming away with a way to see anything that I need to do that I'm, that I'm having trouble with that may have moving parts to put it into the whole of who I am, to start seeing how I can play with it so that it becomes more part of me. Yes. And then to, and then to have, to use it to, to, you know, bring up the things that are inhibiting me, mm -hmm. acknowledge those as well. And then, and then, and then have all of that, you know, hold it. And, and then when we can do that, I think we are seeing it more. It is like integrating with an instrument, but it's integrating with this thing that, that we're going to do and, mm -hmm. and, and gives us, I wouldn't call it mastery, but, but artistry. Because, so we're engaging with it art, artistically with it. That's what mm -hmm. I'm experiencing from what, yeah. from what you said. And I just love how that image has kind of expanded and gotten richer and richer through this session. Yeah, so, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Is there any last thing that you want to say about overwhelm? No, I think that if, I, except I will say that at the minute any of us, and this is true for me too, start to feel overwhelmed, the sooner we can do one of those practices of the body scan, stream of consciousness writing, or the schematic with the mandala around it, mm -hmm. then the sooner we're going to be able to come back to our whole self. So and bring our and bring our whole self in into the moment and actually be be engaging fully with whatever we're doing whether that's art or music or living or our dialogue your dialogue like we have. that's right yeah. wow thank you so Perfect. much kathleen you i are really welcome. appreciated this and i look forward to seeing you next week okay bye bye right. bye bye